welcome to a new episode of Outside the Panels with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to another episode of Outside the Panels. Yes, it is me, Johnny the Machine Hughes. It feels like I have never been away this week with yet another fantastic comic book and comic book creator. Thank God we've got someone so exciting so we can talk about their great book to keep me awake after all these pods. Who the thunk, right? So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to writer, creator, artist from across Marvel, DC, boom. Now working for Humanoids, we're talking to Mr. Ibrahim Mustafa. Hello. Ibrahim, how's it going? I'm well, sir. How are you? I am very, very well. Thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to talk about uh, yourself and your latest book, Retroactive, from I'm Humanoids Comics. Always happy to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you sharing your platform and your time. Oh, you're more than welcome. More than welcome. Let's get to the nitty gritty. Um, retroactive, bit of a time travel story, bit of a spy thing going on. What's the what's the law down? What can you yeah, tell us about this so book? My my elevator pitch for it is uh James Bond meets Groundhog Day. Um, Funny enough, on my notes, I wrote Groundhog Day. Yeah. On my notes. <laughs> I, I love a good time loop story, and uh we've never seen one, to my knowledge at least, uh that's like a, a spy thriller, you know, that, okay. that deals with espionage. And those are two of my favorite genre you know subgenres, and i thought what if i mashed them together and you know made something out of it so mm-hmm. um it's essentially the story of you know it's it's about 20, 30 years in the future or so mm-hmm. time travel exists but it's like a secret thing you know government organizations uh-huh. control yeah. it right so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have the, nudge, the nudge, wink wink exactly yeah, <laughs> so we have the bureau of temporal affairs which is sort of like the us's cia of time travel and then you know mi6 has a branch of it and and then you've got the uh, Japan, China, and uh, Russia all have their own agencies. And okay. so there's kind of a Cold War brewing of, you know, Russia might go back in time to try to screw something up for the U.S. in their favor. And so, no, they, you know. No comment on Russia. Right. Just, <laughs> right. Just, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, this agency exists to go back and, and stop that from, you know, being changed yeah. retroactively. Right. Mm-hmm. Um They will also try to avert terror attacks and and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Um, And so our main character is investigating some anomalies in the timeline that don't Mm -hmm. have a specific signature. Because, like, if Japan goes back in time, the U.S. can tell, you know, because everyone has their own unique signature to it. But these anomalies don't have a signature. So he and his partner are investigating it, and he essentially gets trapped in a time loop and yeah, has to figure his way out and uh, cool. stop the nefarious plan so well you mentioned groundhog day so hopefully you doesn't have to learn to play the piano or anything like that right no piano playing no <laughs> sunny and chair in the book you know <laughs> <laughs> no groundhogs right, all right. okay <laughs> all right so you're you're no stranger to james bond you Correct. worked on james bond yes yes so how was that then kind of using that knowledge and experience of working on james bond that would be for dynamite mm-hmm. yep yeah uh, i've got to say right from the right from the start dynamite's interpretation of james bond through the various uh minis and the runs they've had has been absolutely bang on yeah i, I absolutely cannot fault it. it has all been fantastic and you're part of that so well done Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm a I'm a big, big James Bond fan. Um, the novels, the movies, mm-hmm. um, the comics, mm-hmm. and so yeah, getting to work on it was incredible. Especially, you know, one of my earliest writing and drawing credits uh, was a one shot I got to do called James Bond Solstice. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a thirty pager about basically Bond doing a favor for M around the holidays. Um, and you know, it's a, it's a high stakes favor. It involves, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, um, no I've seen Jingle all the way. I know how, yeah, you know how, how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> he has to, he has to get a specific action figure for <laughs> M's kid. And, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I got to work on James Bond origin, which was really fantastic because we were effectively, you know, that was in the Fleming continuity. Mm. So this is, it was a prequel to, you know, the bond that we know from Casino Royale onwards. Mm. So. 
uh, we actually got to affect, you know, what, I mean, there's, you know, uh, there's a line in, in the novel Casino Royale that Bond learned to play cards during the war from some Corsicans. Mm -hmm. And so I got to help tell that story, which was pretty cool. Cool. Um, so yeah, I brought that to this book in a lot of ways. Uh, mainly the structure of the story is very Mm -hmm. similar to like a Bond story. Cool. There's um, a couple of bits in the book that I'm going to try and get to, but that actually blew me away. Um, one of my, one of the, I think one of the most ambitious things people do with comic books, and when it when it goes wrong, it goes wrong. But when you get it right, boy, does it look great. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, right. I'll tell you what. Enough chitty chat. Let's have a quick look, shall we? Whoa! Check that out. Is that the cover? That's the cover. That's for the book. cover, That's... and I I designed it in a way that if you rotate it, it's it's kind of a you know, uh-huh. it's a different image but the same kind of layout. Um, oh, there's a lot in this book about like the cyclical nature of time and and okay. so you know loops and things like that. So I wanted it to physically be something that you could actually turn around and mm-hmm. you know interact with. I've got to ask then. I've got to ask because we're talking about time, so we've got to we've got to say. <sighs> All right, headaches at the ready. So what's the version of time travel? Is this a linear thing or is it a Marvel Universe thing or is it a Doctor Who thing? Because like everybody, oh, even the Quantum Leap thing. Right. Oh. I, you know, I, I kept it very limited. You know, I didn't want it to. There's a, there's a line in the movie Looper that I love. I don't know if you've okay. seen Looper. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, you know, Bruce Willis is sitting with his younger self at uh-huh. a diner, and he's, you know, his younger self is asking about time traveling. He's like, no, 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 we're not going to get into that, you know, because mm-hmm. we'll be making diagrams with straws and napkins, and you know, we don't have time. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I and I love that. You know, I love that it's like, if, if yeah, you get know. too into the nuance, you know, <laughs> okay. um, I there is some explanation for a lot of it in this book, but it I don't. It's it's not meant to be you know like Scientific too much accurate yeah yeah because it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know it's made up right um, yeah 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 it's like the, it's like that line in the Avengers movie when uh, Ant Man says what so Back to the Future lied well of course it lied it was a movie you know, right hello. right <laughs> uh, you know, and, yeah uh, so there are rules in this but you know it, just to keep it contained and so it's yeah. not a MacGuffin where you can just boop yeah. boop boop and then beam up yeah. to wherever you want you know good good because that's that's why I think one of the one of the problems I think when you when you talk time travel is mm-hmm. you know we, we've seen that recently in you know in in the Avengers movie. I mean everyone loves the spectacle of Endgame and the dudes coming back through the big circles. Everyone loves right. that and everyone cheers. Well, there's a great big whop and great big plot hole in there, and you kind of think, well, if and the same with Doctor Who fans, how come how come anything bad ever happens? Because it's like you've got a TARDIS, right? You just go back and fix everything, but, right? You know, and that's actually one of the things i i deal with like right off the the bat in this book is like the idea that you know there are certain things you have to leave alone like the opening of the book addresses the question of like you know big question yeah would you go back and kill hitler right yeah yeah Yeah, and uh... and yeah so you know i i wanted to i wanted to talk about that first and foremost and say like here's why you might not do that you know as much as it sucks as much as you'd want to here's why this agency has to save Hitler's life, mm-hmm. you know, which sucks. Um, and so, yeah, we, we get in, in the book, we get into a lot of the morality of it and the, you know, and the, and the main character gets a bit disillusioned by what they do for a living mm-hmm. when he kind of starts to realize the ramifications that it can have. Mm, cool. Excellent. Um, let's have a quick look at the book. Then. Let's, shall we? Let's see if we can get the book going on here with the pop. Uh, so describe your art style because i like i like the kind of realistic look that you go for here this feels like this feels like people doing mm-hmm. people things <laughs> we'll put that sense. on the on the next uh yeah, cover please, yeah feels like do. people doing people things well, but you know what i mean it's not yeah like, no absolutely it's not, like, it's not like super dynamic where it's right. like unbelievable pauses and it's like you know, hero wearing a tweed jacket. It's a dude right. wearing a che- tweed jacket and a flat cap. Right. And that's what he looks like. Right. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. That I would, Yeah, I would describe my style as, I, I call it stylized realism, you know? Perfect. It's Perfect. not It's not a photo r- realistic look, but it's, it's recognizable, you know? But I get a little bendy with it. I skew perspective. I, mm. you know, get a little bit of... Um, you know, just stylization to, to faces and facial expressions and things like that. So 
I want it to be believable, but still feel like you're looking at a comic book, you know? Cool. I love this bit here, this whole uh, through the through the sights bit. I thought that was really well done. Thank Proper, you. It, it works on, on a story level as well as an image level because it brings, ironically, or on purpose even, it brings the topic of what you're trying to do into focus. Right. And it does it visually. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait, there you go. Which you find, which you find more more satisfying writing or, or art because i think if you if you if you can do both you know there's a some pretty big names in the comic fields that manage to do both the the combination of the two is is definitely the most satisfying if i had to pick one or the other i i would prefer drawing i think um Ooh. yeah i just you know i use this uh metaphor a lot but it's it's like when you get to write for yourself to draw mm -hmm. it's like it's like picking out your own clothes but when you're drawing from somebody else's script, it's a bit like they go into your closet and say, wear this shirt and these pants. And you're like, I wouldn't, I, I don't think that, I mean, I'll do it, but you know. <laughs> do I have so, to wear the polka dots and stripes again? <laughs> right. It kind of, it allows you to put your best foot forward and, you know, in, in the way that, you know, that's a shirt, I, that's an outfit I would wear on a job interview or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, but yeah, there's something about drawing. I mean, that was my first love. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I started writing to, you know, I guess better tell my own stories. Um, okay, but yeah, the drawing is the is the super passionate part for me. So now that now that you're established as a writer with with the various books you've you've done, do you find it hard to? I'm going to say go back, but I don't mean it that way. Do you find it hard to take a step back and just uh, and be just the artist? And uh, when you when you think to yourself, man, I would I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have paced it this way. I would have plotted it that way. I would have I wouldn't use that camera angle. I would use this one, and so on and so forth. Do you kind of, do you find you have like this inner turmoil of of what a writer wants versus what you would do? Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm I'm fortunate that I typically end up working with folks who have similar sensibilities to me. So, uh, like I just did a, a Wolverine, like an old man Logan one shot recently with Stephen okay. Denight, who who was the showrunner and I believe writer director of uh daredevil season one on netflix okay and cool. his Love. his yeah he, he was fantastic to work with his stuff was so cinematic like i there was nothing on there that i thought oh this would be better if we did it this way it was it yeah. was perfect um you, i i do also, say sorry, I, was, I, was, I was just thinking didn't he also work on smallville was that yes that he did yes, yeah he and did. i believe angel and you know he's Got some bona fides, that yeah. guy. <laughs> I, love, I love Smallville. I'm old school Smallville, so you know. I oh, love, same. Yeah, I, lo I love Brian Q. Miller. What a guy! I love yeah. his Batgirl book. To me, people talk about how they want to make Barbara Gordon fun and all this and all that. I'm like, you had that book with Steph Brown, and you cancelled it. So yeah, hey, oh, yeah. No, Smallville was <laughs> pretty integral to my my comics. Me getting into comics is that yeah. you know. Cool. I loved Superman as a kid, and then the show came on when I was in high school, and it reminded me, oh, yeah, I like this stuff. And then I, you know, yeah. down the rabbit hole from there. But, um, yeah. yeah. Go on. That's fine. Oh, I was going to say that, uh, uh, one thing um, with this book that I did is I did a lot of circular motifs uh -huh. just to kind of, you know, like – as a as a sort of subtle nod to the the cyclical you know time okay. loop thing and stuff so on that last page you know we've got the 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 sites as the panel borders and then you know throughout the whole thing there's mm. circles kind of everywhere in the imagery in the in the background you know some of the like a circle shaped light fixture or bench mm -hmm. or something so i kind of i kind of did that all throughout and that's uh one of the benefits of being the writer and artist is you get to do that kind of stuff and sort of plan it from the get-go you know cool it's really yeah uh, i'm just looking through the book and, and there's some pages that absolutely blow me away um and we're going to talk about a couple oh, thank of them you. In, a, in a moment let me just find which panel it, oh you know there's, there's a page right i'm going to show you a page it's a little bit further on that i wanted to show but this is what i'm talking about when i think about one of the things that can go dramatically wrong and one of the things that you've done fantastically well all right Sure, okay. yeah. I'm I'm excited to see what I do. <laughs> a no word page. Yeah. This is to me one of the hardest things to get right. Because mm -hmm. you've got you've got the pace of the story's gotta move, the the art's gotta convey, it's gotta be show, not tell. Right. Yeah. Um, 
the the movement here you've you've got uh, an odd perspective in this middle panel here which really shows that i suppose the height where he's at you've got this movement down the flag which is you know we've seen that stunt a gazillion times on a different movies right. whatever you want to do but he, seeing it here just absolutely blows me away it's such a well-crafted page what how did you come up with with, with the idea of going no words well thank you first of all um i i you know as the artist i'm super happy to just let the art do the storytelling and i think that's one of the benefits again of of you know having the same writer and artist is that mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, like I've been in a position before where we've had a silent panel or, you know, several panels in a page that are silent and I've added kind of sight gag things in the background mm -hmm. or whatever. And then the writer goes in and adds dialogue that wasn't in the script <coughs> for those panels. And it's like sometimes you just got to let let the art do this, you know, less is more show don't tell kind of thing. So mm -hmm. um, I, you know as a as a visual storyteller it's one of my favorite things to just yeah. you know let it breathe like that i've seen it done twice i've seen it done loads of times but i've seen it done twice exceptionally well one by jim aparo and john byrne on a batman story the main mm -hmm. death of batman and one funnily enough on a star wars book um, oh yeah and and basically lando and luke had gone off and got captured it was up to r2 and chewbacca to go and save the day so you've got these two characters that don't speak any sort of intelligent language. Right. And you've got, and you've got them trying to skulk around this alien, like, Mos Eisley type place. Yeah. And absolute, but, the, you know, and towards the end, you know, Chewie makes a, a, a chewy noise and that makes a beepy noise. But just the whole the whole concept of the, the two pages were following these characters that can't communicate with each other. Yeah. Just absolutely. That's great. Tickled, tickled my, my funny board. I think yeah. I think off the top of the head, I'm going off my top of it. It's, I think it's Star Wars 63 in the first Marvel run. So, okay. So go check that. I'll have to dig it out now just to prove I'm right or wrong. Um, <laughs> excellent. Um, so, Groundhog Day, you mentioned. Um, are you a fan of that film? Is that why you chose part of it for your inspiration for the Oh, yeah. I love, I love time loop stories in general. Uh, Groundhog Day is a favorite. I love uh -huh. uh, Edge of Tomorrow, the Tom Cruise, Emily Blunt movie. I'm not um, one, of the few, one of the few Tom Cruise movies I have not seen. Oh, you got to watch that one, man. Yeah. It's really good. It's Edge really of, good. Edge of Tomorrow. Yeah. They, they rebranded it live die repeat at some point but oh, i think okay. it's still edge of tomorrow if you look it up i don't know it was a weird thing that that was a very uh underrated movie i think I, I, like a lot everyone who saw it was like that was fantastic but i yeah. think it you know um yeah that was actually based on a novel that was also adapted into a manga so i think that's the only other time loop comic okay. book out there that i know of i mean there could be more that i'm just not aware of but yeah. Cool. Um, well. So yeah, that was another thing. You know, it's it's not a genre we have much or a subgenre uh, that we see a lot in comics. We see a lot of time travel stuff, but yeah. you know, never yeah. the the loop. So I I thought that'd be a fun thing to to attempt. Cool, excellent. Right, whilst we get ready for more questions and more art down the line, time for one of our adverts for one of our other shows. And if we're talking about if we're talking about time, I'm afraid. There's only one short to show. Here it is. Do you want to find out what makes a professor do his happy dance? Check out the Old Timers Comic Book Show only on UCPN. That's right, the Old Timers Comic Book Show where the horse aren't old, but the comics most certainly are. There you go. What can I say? I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fun show. It's books that are at least 25 years old. Okay. So right. the definition of vintage, right? Well, vintage, vintage for some people, but they have gone back to Action Comics number one and Detective 27 and wow. Aven Avengers 4 and all that sort of stuff. So they do the whole, the whole gauntlet of, of, of that era. Um, That's I think fine. Next, next, next up is, um, funny enough, <laughs> Coincidentally, it's a uh, retro retcons. retcons. Oh, there we go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll be an interesting one. Um, what was it like working with some of the talent that you've got in this book? Because when I look through 
uh, the list. You've got Brad Simpson on colours. You've got um, I've lost the, the list where it is. Hassan Otsmin Elal on Letra. So I mean, Hassan's been absolutely killing it for the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So what's it like, kind of working with all that level of guys? It's fantastic. I mean, they're they're two of the very best in the industry, and uh, you know, I'm just lucky that they say yes and have the time and we you know i think we all have a uh, a good workflow together and um we enjoy each other and so yeah it's been really fun i know haas had a lot of fun on retroactive specifically he's told me because he got to do a lot of the sound effects in a more illustrative way oh, yeah, um yeah. and he's really he's really clever with the way he incorporates them into the art and then uh, -huh. uh brad would color them mm -hmm. so uh you know he he was coloring both Haas and I, and he's just, I mean, he's incredible. Like his, his, the, the sweeping vistas of sky that he, this man can, mm. you know, bring to life on the page. And, and uh, yeah, I, I just, I can't imagine not working with them. And I, I'm trying to, you know, hitch my wagon to their horses, <laughs> you know, as much as I can. <laughs> I struggle for the metaphor there. Yeah. Um, all right. So I'm sure I'd have to double check, but I'd be pretty, I'd be pretty amazed if Hassan wasn't your letterer on the James Bond book, to be fair. Uh, that um, was uh, Simon Bowland. Oh, yeah. There you, there you go. Yeah. Because I, I, know, I know Hassan does a lot of work for, for Dynamite. So yeah. He, Simon's another good guy. An absolute Simon's guy. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he, I believe he's lettered all of the James Bond stuff. Okay. Um, cool. So he's been the one through line the whole time. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, excellent. So... Um, we'll do a little, a little bit more of your circular reference -y stuff. Um, let me bring this one up. Which do you find harder to do? Work on your own books or work on stuff like Old Man Logan? Uh, I think working on, you know, work for hire stuff is harder for me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you feel like maybe there's an expectation because, you know, these characters are loaded with years and years of continuity and fans and things mm -hmm. like that. And and it's just a little bit easier when you're controlling it all and you're, you know, it's sort of the, the buck starts and stops with you, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, it, no one can tell me anything and this is wrong or, <laughs> you yeah, know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like, well, I made it up. Shut up. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, bless. Yeah, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a great point. I mean, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people who are in, who do Kickstarters, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Kickstarters seem, tend to be a great way to go if you want full control with no editorial sort of contact other than the fact that this is your story and you want to go that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But I, you guys, you're working with Humanoid, so that's that's Mark Wade, right? Yeah, Mark is the publisher, and then uh, the editor I worked with on this is a guy named Rob Levin, who is fantastic. Um, you know, again, just like a pleasure to work with and kept the trains running on time and would, would be there to check any logic questions with the time travel mm -hmm. stuff. And, um, yeah, oh, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, w I worked real hard to, to keep it concise and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I made diagrams and stuff to share with him. So it was like, you know, um, but when you're so close to it, it's so helpful to have somebody else there to say, well, yeah. what about this? You know? Yeah. Totally. You, you kind of get focused. You get kind of tunnel vision, don't you? Right. On one particular aspect, and then before you know it, that that in that that little hint has now become the major focus of the story. Right. And you're like, you know what? It's not hidden anymore. You need to to backtrack a little bit. Right. And um, I, I'm pleased to say there was only I think one time where my explanation to him was it's time travel. You know. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's Batman. All right. Yeah. Move on. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um again some more focus circle elements going in there this circle thing I'm, obviously they've got they've got the technology they've got their little communicatory type thing again circular mm -hmm. you know the time it's a clock it's clock faces around exactly yeah you know the, it, it it seems quite it, it seems like such a, a logical yet simple visual metaphor to make but here it works yeah, thank you. I, I definitely, I think more than any other project I've done, I really played with the, the visual language of comics with this mm. one. Um, you know, when we get into the time loop sequences, there's a, a symbol that I put in the corner of every panel to, mm. that indicates that, okay, we're, we're starting a new, you know, loop now. Yeah. Um, 
because you know in comics you don't have the benefit of like audio cues or smash cuts in the same mm. way you do with with movies or tv mm. you know it's audio visual so um giving the reader like something you know symbolic to go okay we're starting a new one you know mm -hmm. uh, i think was a really helpful device mm. i've just watched i'm going through a bit of a star trek next gen phase um and i've recently watched the one where the ship blows up every five minutes <laughs> oh yeah play, yeah they're playing poker and that and they're, they're coming across the bozeman and stuff i can't remember what it's called i can't remember for the life of me remember what's called but you know you've got like that 10 minute bit and you're absolutely right because it starts when they're playing cards and it ends when the enterprise blows up right and then it restarts you yeah know? so you kind of you're absolutely right from a from a I suppose from a media like TV or, or movies, you're getting that instant sort of like spectacle. Right. And then you have to draw back from that. Where in comic books, it's kind of more, you know. Right. You, you're, not, you're also not in control of the reader doing this. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Or they might put it down to go make some dinner or something, right? And so, no. you know. I'd be a comic book reader that puts a comic comic book down to, re to make dinner. No, you finish the book first. You I mean, you know, fingers, that's true. Yeah, it depends. I mean, these this is a full 120 page graphic novel, though, right? So it's a little longer to get through than a, than your, you know, single issue. No, it's a, you gotta say, surely, surely, you would hope, with the fact that time travels involved, you would hope that people would sit. And oh, that's it. always the hope. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I will say I've had everyone who's read it thus far has told me like I I I did it in one sitting. Like I couldn't, you know, I didn't yeah. stop reading it. I just had to get through it. So that's been nice. And that was, you know, that's what you hope for, obviously. Do you find, and this is, I suppose, um, I suppose this is, this is a bit of a, a tricky question. So, so apologies for this. Do you find that you mentioned time travels and MacGuffin, mm -hmm. you know, so the recent, I say recent, the Zack Snyder Justice League right. movie movie miniseries whatever it was right you know when you've got a character like the flash inherently at any point in time at any point in the story you can go and change everything do you find that that kind of takes something away from the kind of peril that the characters find themselves in you know i think when it's not done right it absolutely can and i think like with that that uh movie for example he sort of didn't realize he could do it until the end. And so, you know, it was kind of like, okay, well, I guess moving forward, if he can do that all the time now, that could be a problem, right? But I think yeah. he's also going to see the ramifications of doing yeah. it. Yeah, I, I, I just kind of think it's, it's you know, it was used in the Justice League movie. It was moved in the animation movie, uh, the J Justice League Dark sequel with Dark Side in it. I just, I, I, it, it, it's that, I think it's very creative if you can move away from that magic reset button. And yeah, I think I've it's met... a real problem in like Superman the movie, for example, where he flies yeah. around the Earth back. It's like, well, then what did I just spend two hours watching yeah, all this yeah, work? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. I could have yeah. taken it all the way back. Yeah. 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 And I was very careful with this, not, you know, I mean, like they, the time travel in this, they can only go to one point in the past and back to the present and you know it's 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 monitored by a you know an agency so they can't just like willy-nilly go back and do whatever they want whenever yeah. um and that's actually kind of what they're up against with these anomalies in time it's like they're not beholden to any specific yeah. agency so they're trying to figure out who are these people that could be doing that and we got to stop them you know yeah. um i want to talk a little bit if i may let me just uh, get back to where I wanted to be. I want to talk a little bit about um, the the credits on your kind of page. Maybe not the credits, but I suppose the comments. You've had some pretty great comments from some pretty strong people on here. You've had, um, let me find them. Yeah, we've got a forward from Phil Hester, which was yeah. incredible because he's uh, one of my, you know, artistic inspirations. On here, on this little bit here, you've got you've got a comment from Stephanie Phillips, who is an absolute indie legend for Dark Horse, who's mm -hmm. now moved over on uh, Harley, and she's doing a great job. Right, Wonder and Woman 
as yeah. well. Yeah. She, she's absolutely made a whole sort of a niche for herself, pretty much the same way Ram V did when he moved from Vault mm-hmm. onto Justice League and, and Swamp Thing. Um, and then my my favourite one, the one that absolutely blows me away, is a guy at the bottom, Tony, I always get his name wrong, Tony oh, Fleece. Tony Fleece, Flex, yeah. Yeah. Stray Dogs, for me, was the breakout hit of last year. Yeah. You know, it was, you know, unbelievably well done. Yeah. Um, I had uh, the, Brad Simpson colored that as well. Yeah. I've had, yeah. I've had the luxury of, of, of interviewing Tony about Stray Dogs, and what a great guy. So when when you see names like of that caliber commenting and putting great comments on about your book, how does that make you feel? Oh, it's wonderful. And you know, Tony, for example, is a, is a very dear friend of mine. So um, you know, he was kind enough to to grace our uh, our inside front page with you know a, a very nice quote about the book and took the time to read it mm-hmm. out of his very busy schedule. Um, uh-huh. You know, I mean, yeah, Michael Walsh, Steve Lieber, we, we were super yeah. fortunate to get some really wonderful folks to say nice things about the book. So, And then you'll have me next issue saying uh, people doing people. Yeah, right, yeah. Mm. Somehow I don't think I'm in the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite yet, but still. <laughs> you never know, right? Excellent. Okay, so um, the book itself is due out on April 26th, 27th. Um, online let's show some stuff let's let's give you some info if you are there you go check out your social medias there you've got your instagram going on you've got your twitter got some youtube yes sir i i do uh, a lot of uh action figure customization so that's a lot of what goes up on my Ah. youtube is painting little heads and you know building batmobiles and all that good stuff see if I'd known that at the start, I would have shown the Crisis in the Toyverse advert instead of Four Diamonds. <laughs> eh, no worries. Oh, man. Yeah, so um, we have a show called Crisis in the Toyverse by Bobo, and he, he loves figures. So it's nice. fast. I'll have to check it out. Do, uh, you know what? Because you, you asked so nicely. All right, let's, let's have a twofer. Check let's Crisis out. Yeah, here we go. There you go. That might be right up your couple. Of, right, oh, right, 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 right. I, I have a couple of the figures he was showing in there. Uh, a man after my own heart. <laughs> there you go. He uh, he knows his stuff. Bless him. Um, you mentioned earlier that you're out. You try not to be photo realistic. However, that I would have to say there is not not real. There it is real. You're absolutely stylized realism is absolutely a great way of describing it. Are there any sort of in your head? Are there any sort of models that you think, oh, this needs to look like? Or this needs to look like whomever. Obviously, apart from the, you know, Hitler who actually, you know, looks like Hitler. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, no, you know, I try to I try to design characters from whole cloth. Um, because okay. I personally when I'm reading something, if I see like, oh, they just traced, you know, yeah, uh, Tommy Lee Jones or whatever, it makes me go like, ah, eh, I don't really care about this anymore. <laughs> I don't know. There's a there's a guy in the beard with a beard in the early pages. He looks kind of looks familiar. Have you got a flat cap? Just oh no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it, to some extent, anyone with brown hair and a beard is going to look like me, I guess, right? So I, <laughs> Duke, uh, I suppose, yeah. But right I, you know, I've never uh, <laughs> like I, I a lot sometimes too. You'll see if I if you know what an artist looks like, and you're flipping through their work, and you're like, yeah, that's just them. Like they just trace <laughs> themselves in Photoshop. It kind of pulls me out of it, you know, like yeah, yeah. So I like it to try to be its own thing as much as possible. No, no, it's a, it's a good shout. It's a good shout. Uh, the, the costumes uh, scream Peaky Blinders at me. 
but at first I was like, what? What's this? But you know. oh yeah, yeah. I mean, we're yeah. in we're in you know 1939 uh, yeah. France in there, so I, I had to be period accurate, right? Yeah, yeah. No anachronistics there, yeah. right? <laughs> other, well, other than their their uh, yeah. weapons, which is a whole actually a plot point in the book, they have to not leave their stuff behind. You know? Yeah. Don't don't be yeah. Uh, don't be damaging the timeline. Exactly. Um, working on humanoids. What was it like? You said you read it has been fantastic to get work with Mark as well, Mark Weird. Yeah, uh, Mark is actually a, a big part of why I'm doing books there. Um, he, re my first book with them was called Count, and it was a um, mm -hmm. a remix of, of the Count of Monte Cristo, like a sci-fi kind of yeah. re retelling. Um, and he was the one who read the script and and told you know the higher ups like you gotta you gotta publish this book. And then after that, uh, he, you know, he offered me when he became publisher, he offered me a three book deal with them. So uh, Retroactive is my second book. And I actually just finished the script for the third one last night. So uh, really, yeah. really let, let, let's just uh, make a quick note. Third one. What's it called? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> too early to too early to tell yet. But oh, um, dope. Almost but yeah, no. Mark's been wonderful. He's a he's he's been a, a big uh, supporter, thankfully. And you know, he's on my Mount Rushmore of comics. So mm -hmm. I mean, to have his you know co-sign is a pretty spectacular thing. Yeah, I've uh, again I've been lucky to uh, interview Mark on his sci-fi history of sci-fi book. Yeah, that came out a while ago, which was an absolute blast to read. Uh, no copyright infringements ever in that book at all. <laughs> 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 nudge, nudge, wink, wink, as they say. So, um, retroactive. It's out on April twenty sixth online. Um, so you should be able to get it from. Let me just double check. Um, check out these websites. There you go. You've got yourself, and you've got retroactivecomic.com. Um, and of course, it'll be out in comic book shops uh, the next day. Good old new comic book day. Oh yeah. yeah. Happy cool. Wednesday, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's actually a trailer for Retroactive at that website at retroactivecomic.com. So folks can check out the trailer and then there are links to order it there as well. Perfect. So we'll just leave that there for a little bit so people can write it down. There you go. Cool. Um we'll make sure that the links are, are posted on the blurb underneath. So go and check that when you've finished watching this. Don't stop beforehand. Cool. Yeah, comic readers, right? You got to do it all the way through. Don't get greasy fingerprints on it, and then yeah. You know. <laughs> the things that the things you've learned for, about me today is uh, <laughs> people do peopley things and don't eat and read comics. And, um, oh my! Goodness. I did have I I used to work in a restaurant uh, while I was trying to break in to comics, and I had a a nice hardcover in my in the room with me. You know, the little office that I worked in. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my coworkers came in to eat her dinner and mm -hmm. was looking through my book and she just got like greasy fingerprints all over like a nice inky page. Yeah, and I was just yeah. like, what are you yeah. doing? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, not quite as bad for a, for a comic book, but I, one of my early jobs was working at a petrol station, like a, like a gas station. Mm -hmm. I have to Americanize that up, I guess. A gas well, I, station. Yeah. <laughs> I, I watch enough British TV. I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, I had a I had a Star Trek book, like one of the pocket books, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I'd finished reading it, and the guy who was on the late shift to me said, "Oh, because I've got I've got nothing to read. Can I read the book?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, you know, take good care of it." Handed it in the book, came in the next day. He bent it like backwards Oof. and like creased the whole spine, and it was like broken. I was like, "This is why I don't hand books out, man." Yeah, yeah. I, oh, books. yeah. I can't stand that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. It, I know there's a logic to having digital comics, but I I must prefer having the physical. Yeah. So there's nothing like turning a page, you know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. How's that? I mean, that. For, how does that work for you then, as a creator? Because you've got to. Because that's when I read a comic, I get that the writer and the artist have to worry about where the advert page is, where the double spread's going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you want the action to be at the bottom of the page to turn it over. When it, Sometimes that doesn't translate well digitally. Do you, is that something that you have to think about? Or do you kind of just think, well, you know what? I'm going to make it for the comic book market and online be damned. Well, my first book was, was a digital first book. So, uh, and that eventually went to print. So mm -hmm. 
I, it's just always kind of been part of the process for me. I don't, I don't do a lot of double page spreads really. Okay. Um, okay. It's, you know, I think it, like in count, there was one. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any in retroactive other than like a, a title page. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I, I don't really, you know, when you're doing a, a, an original graphic novel like this, you don't have to worry about advertisements and whatnot. So there's no, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of times people will do double page spreads you know, in like Marvel and DC comics on purpose yep. so that they don't have to break it up with an ad, you know, in the action and stuff. <laughs> so, so, so what you're saying that the double spreads are the artists being passive aggressive. Uh well it's it's oh. more like, you know, you don't want like I, I heard Bendis talk about this once actually. Like you he started doing that so that the storytelling wouldn't get broken up in like a, a bad spot, you know. Yeah, that's um so yeah and I just uh I yeah I guess I just don't tend to do a lot of them. So yeah. You know, uh, digital paper, whatever people, whatever's easiest for them. I know, you know, some folks have, uh, you know, are differently abled and they need to be able to zoom in on on the digital page. And so I don't want to make it, you know, something that is difficult for folks. Right. That, right. You just put it close to your eye. Right. Is that not how it works? Uh, I mean, I have great vision, so I couldn't tell you. But <laughs> oh, look at you. Dragging, dragging with your brown hair you know, and no glasses. Not, not yeah. a big deal, you know. Um, <laughs> No, but you know, I'm I'm just happy when people consume them. However, works yeah, for them. It's so a fair shout. that's a fair shout. Who are your current inspirations right now in the comic book field? Where are you getting? What what sort of books are you reading? Uh, you know, uh, the the one of the more recent things I read uh, was the recent volume of Something's Killing the Children, and that book is just phenomenal. They, uh, you know, the, the artist crams so many panels into a page. And you would think it wouldn't work, but it absolutely does. And it, okay. and it's like it's always a beautiful layout. It's always well paced. Yeah. So I've been I've been looking at that a lot as a way to, you know, sort of break up dramatic moments more and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that. And then I've also I'm I've currently have on order a volume of Space Girl by Travis Charest. Um, Does he, I know that one? He, I know I, Travis. Is, yeah. yeah, he's he's a modern master. I mean, his work is just incredible, and so. Uh, I finally tracked down a, a volume of of Space Girl that was at a decent price, and so that's it's going to be in French, so I won't be able to read it, but I'll at least be able to flip through. <laughs> Sacre bleu! Yeah, yeah. If that comes up, I'll know. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, know what that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It might. I, that's French is good. It took me three years to work out that Ajard we meant today, but you know that's why I dropped yeah. it into German. It's so. one more word than I didn't than I knew. So. <laughs> Bonjour, ça va? Oui, ça va. Bien, merci. Et tu? There you go. That's hello. How are you? <laughs> so that's pretty much good. And thank uh, you. Right. That's uh, yeah. That's about ex- the extent yeah. of mine. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, holiday French is what I call it. Holiday oh yeah. French. Yeah, it's like holiday Spanish. You know, dos de vaso por favor, and that's pretty much. <laughs> it that's... Um. All right. So, um, who are your favorite writers then? I mean, uh, you know. Mark Wade, I don't, I'm not worried about sucking up because I already work with him. So Mark Wade is definitely. <laughs> yeah, I'm already here. I don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Gosh, Jason Aaron, I've always loved his work. Yeah. Scalped is one of my favorite books of all time. Um, oh, gosh. It's a, I'll think of, you know, 10 more. Andy Diggle is a big one for oh, me. I yeah, really yeah, love Andy yeah, Diggle's work. Yeah. yeah. I love I love the fact I tell this to everyone who, who listens. Andy Diggle is kind of like life imitating art imitating life. Because his work on Green Arrow uh, is the reason why Diggle in the TV show is called Diggle. Right. And then when they did the Arrow comic book, they had to put John Diggle into there. So it's like, it's kind of like full circle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like crazy. People go, really? It's like I'm a, like, yeah. it's almost like a time loop, you know? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Mind blown. Yeah, that's what we do here. <laughs> All part of the service. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Okay. Um, Ibrahim, thank you so much for spending the time. I really do really enjoy talking to you. Your book looks great. It thank reads you. great. Um, like I haven't shown a lot of pictures and panels and pages. You know, it is a long book. But you know what? I don't want to spoil any of the surprises. So, you know, you're just going to have to wait on April the 26th and 27th and find out for yourself. Trust me. It is well worth the wait. There you go. Thank you, sir. You're more than welcome. Don't forget to check out the UCPN for all your favorite shows, including you saw the adverts, you got a two for, for once. 
Yeah, that's right. It's a crisis in the Toyverse. And of course, the old timers comic book show. You never know. We might get round to some of those old Mark Wade books. If we are, I'm thinking probably uh, some of his Justice League stuff. Shh, don't say anything. No kingdom come. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've been your host, Johnny Machine Hughes. Ibrahim, thank you so much for spending the time. Um, and for My pleasure. Else, adios. Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture.